this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to first start giving a historical perspective of what we have been doing for the last 15 years on this topic of research. Then I'm going to briefly describe ongoing activities, and then I'm going to provide to you our long-term view, what we plan to do in the next five years, and, and then I will conclude. So, let's start with historical perspective. Uh, in 2003, the then Public Interest Energy Research Program uh, created, there is some music, are you? No. Uh, <laughs> or change the music? Okay. Uh, from Cumbia or something like that? Okay. So, um, so the, um, okay. So in 2003, we developed a climate change research plan for California, uh, funded by the Energy Commission, Public Interest Energy Research Program. And there we say what we're going to do in the next five to ten years. And I'm happy to say that we did it. We finished the last thing that we were supposed to do to develop quasi probabilistic climate projections for California two years ago. And one of the things that we did was to, uh, uh, Kelly Raymond and she's here, we say also say that we're going to provide a website where you can get climate information for California. The California Climate Change Tracker is not very well known, but it's an excellent tool to track how climate is changing in California. Uh, so, so one of the things that we, we have done is to analyze how climate is changing in California. Uh, for, uh, just to give you an example, there are some monitoring stations in the Central Valley where we, we have actually have experienced uh, relatively uh, uh, temperatures actually the maximum daily temperature this summer has gone down, and we couldn't explain that like five years ago or more. So we embarked on a multiple analysis using regional climate models, but also empirical analysis to try to explain. The bottom line is that irrigation has changed the nature of the temperature trends. Uh, so that's why we have seen some cooling in some regions. And I, I would love to explain that graph, but uh, let's try to do it. So. The graph show the red lines is uh, a, a graph that I adapted from a paper by David Lobel from Stanford. You know, the, the red line show, uh, I mean, from 1920 to 2000, you know, that the difference between the set of temperature between the regions that are already now and nearby areas has gone down. In some cases, have become negative. It is, what it means is that Temperatures in areas that are now irrigated have experienced what I said before, a cooling effect. And that was very well explained by the increasing irrigation areas that shown the blue line there. However, not being complacent, irrigation will not be able to continue masking the climate change signal, and I think we are ready or very soon we will start seeing the rapid increase in temperatures in those areas. Another thing that we do, we did was to intercompare regional uh, uh, climate models. I mean, the global climate models, big models with big, big, big sizes in the order of 100, 200, 300 kilometers, like for example on your on your right left, uh, you see uh, the output from a global climate model where the grid size is so big that the temperatures between between from San Francisco to the Bay to Sacramento is more it's assumed to be uniform. In fact, we know that that's not the case. So the, the graph on the right shows the uh, the downscaling of the temperatures. In this case, you know, taking into account different factors. So there are two different techniques to uh, produce these detailed projections on temperature and precipitation and other variables. One is called a statistical methodology. The other is the dynamic methodology. The statistical methodology uses the statistical relationships between big or large features of weather, or for example, high atmospheric pressure areas, and, and local temperature. Uh, the dynamic models uses the output of the global climate models and then uses the law of physics, uh, basic numerical models, to estimate how climate change will change in the future. So what we found out is the dynamic models, unfortunately, Inherit the biases of the global climate models and therefore produce huge biases for California and therefore they should not be used directly for impact and adaptation studies. The statistical models in some cases may not be physically realistic, like for example, uh, there are high spatial coherence of precipitation that actually don't happen. 
um, but and the both methods should be improved. Um, uh, and I say, we also developed, uh, actually, um, well, we developed a prolific climate projection for California. My understanding is that this was the first study in the United States, and also I think nobody has uh, duplicated that effort so far. So the probability distribution of temperatures inside, for example, the graph on the top shows minimum temperatures in January. What it shows is that the, the, the temperature distribution does just not shift to the right. Actually, the, the, the shape of the probability distribution changes in such a way that very cold, extreme events will not disappear. It will continue in the future. It will just be less frequent, but it still will have, uh, it will be present in the future. With respect to precipitation, uh, it was the same thing. Every little I mean, circle shows the distribution, the probably distribution of temperature on the y-axis and precipitation in the y, in the y-axis. And what it suggests is that precipitation will more or less increase in the northern part of California, but will, will tend, will have a tendency to decrease in the southern part of California. Now, this is all work, or this is using the prior 27 or something like that, uh, IPCC models. Now we're using the new version of the global climate models that were part of the 2013 IPCC report. Sea level rise projections, uh, I mean, we have been using sea level rise projections. The first California assessment uh, used the uh, sea level rise projections of the IPCC, more or less. Since then, the second and the third assessment estimated that the maximum sea level rise would be in the order of 55 inches, and that more or less, uh, well, the, 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 then there was a, a report by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Dan Canyon and others were part of that uh, group preparing that report, and they found that the range could be even uh, larger. Uh, the median value was actually the lower end. Uh, these are the little green dots that you may see in the green bar. Uh, that was kind of a little lower than uh, the, our, our, the projections that we used in the 2009 and 2012 uh, California assessments. Okay, so let's talk about selecting global climate models for California. So the Department of Water Resources convened a group uh, that I call the Climate Change Technical Advisory Group to help them select and do other things uh, models for water resources planning. I'm not going to go through the, uh, this is showing the copy of the report. I'm not going to go through that. Basically, they look at how well the model simulates global features, Western United States, California, and the group uh, suggested that 10 models are the best models for California. Uh, so, logically, we are not going to just stop with the water courses. We will use the same models for the next California State Climate Change Assessment. Uh, however, additional scenarios will be developed, in part because the, it's very well known that the IPCC global climate models don't cover the full range of uncertainty. For example, they don't simulate prolonged drought. That some studies suggest are more likely than what is uh, estimated by the uh, global climate models. Uh, I mean, one reason that we also need to be careful with selecting the best models is that the models can be right for the wrong reasons. For example, I'm not going to delve into this, but there's a big feature in the tropics. It's called the intertropical com convergence zone. There's only one. But the model simulates two. It's the, uh, uh, I wish I had a point or something, but the, uh, but the graph on your left, uh, the, light, the black is the, the black line is the, the actual observations, and the colors show the, the simulation from global climate models. Basically, there are two bumps, double intertropical convergence zone, that actually is not a realistic, uh, a realistic outcome. Aerosols and uh, aerosols, small particles in the, in the air and clouds are poorly represented or very not, very not, not very well represented in climate models. So we also have to be careful. And so final historical record is only 120 years. So all these analysis and comparing uh, um, uh, models with historical observation is kind of problematic because we only have one realization of a very short time period, 120 years. Um, so, uh, by three years ago, we knew already all of that, that for example, that the, uh, the 
statistical downscaling has some problems. So we commissioned a study uh, that was led by Fisk Institute of Oceanography to develop a new scale of the science, state of the art downscaling technique. It's called LOCA. Uh, the only problem that I have with LOCA is that my town is Lodi. It's using the same name, LOCA, Lo, uh, the wines of Lodi, California. I'm also told by the peers that uh, Loca means the crazy woman in, in <laughs> Spanish, but okay, I couldn't win that battle. Uh, so, so, so this a new modeling technique has been developed. It does things very well. It still has some issues, but I mean that's the nature of research. For example, the model simulates very well extreme events. Uh, the results are more realistic. Uh, there is a the level geographical resolution now is. Uh, Six kilometers, about 3.75 miles, and the modeling uh, results are so good that now federal agencies are supporting the use of LOCA at the national scale. Okay, so so what we want to do is to select the scenarios to cover the range of possible outcomes. So we're going to be using not the outputs of the global climate models, but the outputs of the downscaling results, the, the LOCA. Um, so one thing to note is, so I mean, here are the, uh, the, the outputs for 33, I believe, uh, global climate models downscaling with LOCA for a three point near the Sacramento airport. So the red is the business as usual, the RCT 8.5, and the green is the uh, policy scenario where drastic reductions happen right away in the near future. Um, and we see that at the end of the sector, that essentially ranges for the two scenarios to depart, but in the next 35 years, they don't depart very much. So I think we're going to be assuming is that for the next 30 years, we're out of luck. We are, what we needed already will determine what may happen in the next 35 years. Uh, in addition of using this again, this global climate uh, model downscale scenarios, we're going to also develop drought scenarios because again, there are scientific evidence that the global climate models are, are unrealistically simulating drought conditions, prolonged drought. Okay, a again, the, the issue is that policymakers, our chairman told us to stop looking at the end of the century, look at what happened in the next 30, 10 to 35 years. So that's what we're doing, and again, this is uh, the graph showing is, shows the difference of temperature in 2021 to now I forgot to 2050 in relation to 1961 to 1990. Five minutes. Okay. So, um, so what is so the uh, I mean there are some models that show that you know, the, the horizontal lines, the uh, line for precipitation, the lower line. In that uh, models suggest that uh, we'll, be, we'll be experiencing less precipitation in California. Hello, I'm sorry, not in California, it's for the Sacramento region. But there are some models that uh, we need to pay some attention. They were not the ones, the, the tens that were, have been selected, but those models show that suggest that precipitation will actually will be uh, below uh, 80% of uh, historical levels. So ongoing and planned activities, uh, we're going to be asking Scripps Institution of Oceanography, David Pierce, to continue enhancing the local uh, model to simulate relative humidity, wind field, solar radiation, and uh, an ensemble of, ensemble of projections have been already been, are being generated over in 1950 to the end of the century. We're going to again develop other scenarios. Uh, we will continue using the variable implementation capacity model, which to uh, develop hydrology for California. Uh, again, we will develop a new generation of quasi-probabilistic of probabilistic, quasi -probabilistic climate projections for California and sea level rise projections. That's a new area of work. And instead of just talking about the ranges, we're going to try to come up with explicitation and other techniques to come up with quasi, no real, quasi-probabilistic projections for California. And we're going to develop developing secondary scenarios such as wildfire scenarios for California. Long-term view. So the CAT research, uh, uh, the Climate Action Team Research Working Group uh, issue um, in February 2015 a long-term plan on how 22 
the agencies are going to be working together, how we're going to help each other, and what are our priorities with respect to research. On this topic, uh, we say that we're going to continue uh, working and complementing uh, efforts that needed to produce results that are not only relevant for research in California, but also for long-term plans. Uh, uh, as the Department of Resources have been very instrumental in supporting research for, uh, for atmospheric rivers, the Energy Commission has been extremely, well, has been supporting work on the roles of aerosols on precipitation. And that's one thing that the models don't do well. Global climate models are regional climate. Actually, regional climate models don't even simulate aerosols. So, uh, at least the ones that I know, uh, or that have been built so far. So, the, uh, and the aerosols are very important because we funded a study known as salt water that showed that aerosols have a huge impact on precipitation levels in the Sierra Nevada. And not only aerosols emitted here in California, also aerosols coming all the way from China and Africa a lot. Uh, I think there is a talk about this later on. So, conclusions, uh, California, I think, has done a good job uh, supporting uh, the area of work, and this work has been extremely help helpful. Uh, I think Cliff already mentioned some of the advantages that we have received from this work, but the work must continue. It's continuing, but must be enhanced uh, to allow California to prepare for a changing climate. Thank you very much. Thank you.